Hello, everyone. Nice. Hi. Um, welcome to our next event. Uh, this is Sarah Mesquita. I'm Caroline Loyer. Uh, a lot of people, I think, already know us, so no introduction needed. And we go fast forward to introduce our speaker we have for you today. So, Silvia, Silvia Fierasco. Uh, I think it was good enough. <laughs> good enough. <laughs> uh, so, she has a very nice bio that I will try to to say it like smoothly. So Sylvie Fiasco mm -hmm. earned a PhD in political science and network science from Central European University. She's currently lecturer in the Faculty of Political Science, Philo Philosophy and Communication Sciences, researcher at the Big Data Science Lab, director of the Social Fabrics Research Lab at West uh, University of uh, Temisoara, Romania and co-founder uh, of the global consortium Civic Anti-Corruption Tech Initiative. In these roles, Sylvia leads several large training, uh, large-scale training, uh, R&D and community building projects across sectors using computational so social sciences and new technologies to build sustainable and improved organizational de development public policy, communication flows, and leadership. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for joining us today. And please enlighten us with your presentation. <laughs> that... oh. Thank you very much, Sara, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. So, so um, yeah, I think what Sara wanted to say, basically, is that I'm a very busy person. I keep busy. I try to, to do a lot of things, and mostly during the pandemic times. Uh, my workload tripled because, you know, digital acceleration and, and people realize that we need to change our, the, the way we do things and we need more, you know, data-driven, evidence-based uh, approaches to decision-making because things are getting super complicated and, and complex. So, um, so I was, you know, I rushed into, into uh, saying yes to multiple projects, as you will see today. <laughs> I mean, the, those happened, most of them started before the uh, pandemic, but they, they are alive and well during the pandemic as well. Um, we're, we're trying to, we try to expand uh, several of them in, in different ways. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I hope everybody is, um, you know, all right and hanging, hanging on. It's a tough period, a very busy period, a very tiring period for everyone. So I don't want to, you know, I would like to keep my presentation short and sweet. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I prepared only a few slides, uh, but I would like us really to have maybe a conversation later on. Uh, you know, I, I, I really hope that you will have, we will have the Q&A, a very interactive Q&A session. So um, without going too much into the details, let me share my screen with you and start the presentation. Uh, I hope you can all see it. If you don't see it, then somebody will have to shout. <laughs> All right, so as you heard, I wear many hats. I'm part of, um, my main job is basically at the university. I'm an academic. But I also work on the side. I work in, in the private sector. Um, and I work project-based with different organizations at different, in different sectors. I do, most of the times I do research and development in the social sciences. So this is a little bit different than, um, you know, research and development in the IT sector, uh, or is it? You'll have to tell me if, if there's a difference. For me, basically what it means is that I develop or I work in, in interdisciplinary teams and I try to develop applications and projects that use new technologies um, and, you know, communication strategies um, and visualizations um, in order to improve decision making in, in different types of organizations, whether, you know, those are government organizations or they are uh, businesses going through significant changes or they are civil society organizations. I work with all of them. And it, it gives me much pleasure to do so because, um, as you will see, and as you probably uh, very well know, doing computational social science is a really empowering kind of set skills because it allows you to um, adapt 
your tools in order to provide value in different sectors. So as you see here, you know, I have a, a bunch of representations and I'll present you today a few of my projects. Um, if there is something that I would like you to think about long term is that, you know, we are all super interested in data visualization. We think it is important. It is absolutely important. But I would say um, that in applied projects, the data visualization is a little bit the last thing that you kind of focus on, the last thing on the to-do list. In order to get to do data visualization, you first have to think about many different things. So if you, if you work in a project, in an applied project with a government organization, you have to understand how will they use a particular platform, what kind of data they will have to use, what functions would uh, that particular instrument have to deliver uh, for the users in order for them to be able to do their jobs better, to make decisions better. Um, and in that sense, first we need to think about, you know, why create a tool, a digital tool? Um, how do we design that? What kind of data do we input there? What do we need to do to the data in order to bring it to, you know, sturdy, uh, serious, sustainable quality? And then, find, I would say, the simplest ways, not the most sophisticated ways, but the simplest ways in which to allow the users to interact with the data, to interact with, uh, with their job using new technologies or using digital instruments in order to make better decisions. So although, you know, we are, data visualization is on the rise, and I've seen a lot of very sophisticated uh, data uh, visualizations, especially, for example, in, in journalism, data journalism. I think that's a field that is uh, highly uh, or very rapidly evolving to become, you know, to show very, you know, to, to raise the bar, to raise the standard for good data, data visualization. Uh, when you actually go into providing Automate, automated um, platforms for decision making for organizations of different kinds. You are, you are always uh, forced in a way to go back to the basics, to show information in rather simple ways, very straightforward um, in order to not confuse <laughs> anyone, but re really to just uh, make, you know, actionable insights in a in a snapshot in the in the snap of, in in a blink of an eye so you know if you think about it this way i think you know at the end of the day the data visualization comes last in our in our um, interest list we always start with mapping the functional um, qualities or characteristics of the data platforms that we design. And of course, you know, we have to test them. And I will show you examples of decisions we had to make in terms of simplifying data visualization in different cases. So let me start with the area that is closest to my, to my training and to my understanding, and that is academia. What you see here on the left is an example uh, uh, an example of a prototype that I've put together with two programmers at a hackathon in 24 hours. This prototype was based on my PhD thesis, which was about um, being able, like looking at public procurement data and analyzing it, it, you know, with a very precise methodology in order to extract information about state capture, business and political capture um, in public procurement, basically a form of institutionalized corruption. Um, so, you know, after five years of PhD, where I developed the entire methodology, at the end of the day, it seemed really natural that uh, this kind of research would be very useful if we made it, you know, if we put it into a platform a web interface, an interactive web interface. And that will allow actually the users, uh, like, you know, um, the public, journalists, public administration users, 
to, to understand the context of how institutionalized corruption is affecting you know, interactions between public institutions and businesses, um, and what kind of decisions they have to take in order to prioritize interventions or in order to um, improve transparency and competition. So, as I said, you know, in 24 hours, we put together this prototype. Uh, when you will receive the slides, you will see that you have links to it. Um, we managed to put in this interface six types of information, um, six sections of data information. And this, you can see here the data visualizations about them are very, very simple um, and very straightforward. So, for example, we look at levels of state capture, varieties of state capture, geographical patterns, corruption risks by the issuer type or by the public institution, basically, whether it's a, a government level institution or a local level institution. Uh, we map the corruption networks based on a very precise methodology of quantifying the corruption risk at the level of the contracts, uh, where, you know, certain uh, nodes, for example, the, the larger the node is, the more, you know, the more important that particular institution is in the ecosystem of public procurement and the, the thicker the link between them, that means that the more they contract with high corru corruption risk with other institutions or other uh, businesses. And then we were able to also develop a, an intervention priority matrix so based on the corruption risk index and the importance or the centrality of that particular institution in the public sphere uh, or in the public contracting a sphere, then you would see a very nice two by two table where uh, you would understand that if you are in the right hand upper corner quadrant, then you are high in corruption risk and also an important visible player in the market. Therefore, it's likely that, um, you know, you'll probably get an audit very soon. <laughs> um, or you would, you know, if you're a business doing uh, contracts with uh, public, you know, with public institutions, you would definitely want to find yourself in the lower left quadrant where you are low in corruption risk and uh, also um, um, perhaps like a smaller organization that that can be um, that can continue to do their work either way um, so what you'll be able to see for example in this interface is in this line chart, for example, the trends in state capture measured as the frequency of certain control configurations with high corruption risk in the public procurement market. And then here, four different markets for which we analyze the data from 2009 until 2012. This is just for Hungary, but of course we can expand this into a dashboard, including data on many countries. Um, the user would be able then to um, have the average corruption risk index and, you know, uh, play a little bit with the sorting, um, you know, and have, you know, sort the issuers or the public institutions from the highest in corruption risk to the lowest in corruption risk. And uh, all sorts of other, other interesting information, you know, for the geographical patterns, you need to have a map where you show with different, um, uh, different counties, for example, based on the level of risk associated to the contracts done between public institutions and private organizations. The same, if you look at varieties of state capture, you would be able to see in different markets, for example, how um, political capture, wh whether political capture is higher than business capture in certain situations, and then be able to corroborate that information with other kinds of information. So a very simple prototype, Put together, I actually met the two programmers at a, at an IT barbecue um, two weeks before, and I had this idea. So we talked it over over a beer. I had this idea. Look, you know, I have this interesting research, this interesting data set. Um, this is public data, of course. Um, would you uh, help me, you know, put together a web interface that allows the users to interact with the public procurement data and the corruption risks? And they said yes. And this is the uh, captured is this uh, prototype. It won an award um, at that hackathon, and it was also, um, I still use it in, uh, in conversations with public authorities, and I will speak soon about one of the newest projects that we have regarding the implementation of this platform. 
On the right hand side, uh, with a call with two, one of the programmers that worked on the on the captured application joined uh, another colleague of mine from the political science department and together we put together this prototype called the employability platform. So what this was is um, um, a data analysis and visualization platform uh, designed for to understand where our graduates from the from our university are going to work. So what is the what is the link between what you study and where you go to work uh, on the labor market later on? So we collected the data from 2010 until 2017. Uh, we curated that from the university management system and we linked that database with the National Registry of Employment Contracts. So we, we could identify, we could match, for example, we could identify people um uh, graduates and where they work at different stages of you know points in time so we use that information in order to analyze how our faculties within the university were doing uh in terms of what they what they promise the uh, potential students that they will become and how that actually materializes in reality and we also published a paper based on that um, where we looked at, you know, the, the match between the normative standards and the empirical standards, and we found very interesting things. We looked at, especially at the social sciences level. But what, what this platform particularly had, uh, what, what was really important for this platform to have was very, you know, sophisticated analytics, but very simple way of measuring, uh, of, of showing that information. So, for example, what you see here is a coefficient from, from 0 to 1.2, uh, that was calculated for each faculty based on what they promised um, and uh, weighed on different, um, having a weighting scheme for what they promised and then looking at where, where their graduates ended up. So for example, if a faculty promised you that you will become five things after you graduate, and then the students went and became five things, it will get the 1.2 uh, uh, score, which means it was doing very, very well in providing the graduates exactly what it promised. The lower this um, arc, this uh, visual, this, uh, um, uh, visual uh, would go to the left, to, towards zero, uh, then the lower the match between what they promised and where the students ended up working. So for example, for the political science department, we realized that about 25 25% of our graduates are going into IT companies, but they, but they, we, we didn't, you know, as a faculty, we didn't offer classes that would prepare them for that. So it was a very good, you know, decision-making tool in terms of, first of all, starting a conversation about the curricula and, and how we can include programs and, and classes and things that would prepare our, our students uh, uh, better, you know, get better jobs on the labor market. The Sankey diagram that you see here, for example, shows the main, um, it, you know, maybe some of you recognize these names, these uh, codes. So these codes are the international standard codes uh, for occupations. So basically what these bars show you is uh, the levels of employment at which different portions of the graduates end up going. And the color tells you whether, you know, in what kind of domains they, they go. So um, you would want to have as many people in, you know, if you, if, if you promise that you prepare the students for management positions, then you would want to see, you know, a, a portion of your, your students going into management positions. But what often happens, of course, with uh, these kinds of visualizations is that they show that many students end up working on minimum salaries in jobs for which they are overqualified. So that was one of the, the most important lessons that we've learned from, from these kinds of visualizations, that because you know, when there is a mismatch between what we promise and what we deliver as a university, then you have these kind of problematic uh, outcomes where uh, students end up in, in um, life situations, they, they end up stuck in life situations for a number of years. So we, we look also at five years later, you know, after you graduated where you are, and if you are still in that in the same position, uh, then, you know, that's, that's a problem. Um, and it means that, you know, when that happens 
to a lot of your graduates or a significant portion of the graduates, then it means that you definitely need to change uh, things in the curricula because obviously you it's not adapted to what the market asks for these kinds of 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 graduates or or yeah how the labor market dynamics uh, happen. So besides you know besides this uh, these kinds of uh, visualizations, what we have on that platform are you know maps. For example, we have a map where we show the brain drain uh, for each university area, for example, geographic area. So, so we look, for example, whether a particular university manages to keep the graduates at the local level or it loses the graduates. So they, they finished university in this location, but then they go and work in other parts of Romania. And this index of brain you know, mobility, basically, um, tells us also something about how we can market ourselves. Um, as, as a university, as an institution, uh, what are the, you know, it's, it's a data-driven evidence-based tool basically to, to better improve our communication and branding strategy mostly. So yeah, here are two examples from academia. I'm happy to say that the first one, the captured uh, platform is now, you know, getting, a, um, it, it's basically going at the national level it's much more improved at the moment. We, we, I will show you in a minute how. Um, and also the employability platform, uh, the prototype was uh, was now started at you know at the national level as well. So it's going to be scaled at the national level. Let me go to a second very um, important part of my work, and and this is you know with different. Um, uh, government authorities, in particular, um, at the moment, I'll talk about um, the one in the competition area. So it's, it all started with captured, yeah, with understanding or, you know, analyzing public procurement data. But what I did later on, after I, you know, I, I did a case study on Hungary and I looked in Hungary how things uh, changed over time, um, I expanded the analysis to 28 countries, European countries, and I looked at over 2 million contracts, public procurement contracts. This is all open data. Um, and I applied network science, basically, to understand uh, the network structures of public procurement in different countries and to, to measure the levels of, of business, the state capture in general, but of business and political capture in particular. What was really striking when I was doing this exercise was that it appears, you know, that there was this pattern in terms of network structures of public procurement. So what you see here in the on the left quadrants are actually the entire public procurement markets in a particular country in a particular year, um, or actually not the entire one, but the samples, the only the contracts that are really, you know, considered really low corruption risk with green or really high corruption risk with orange, right? So we don't have any contracts that are in between or in the middle. We have just the ones that we, we know for sure are, I mean, we, we, we know with, certain, with, with certainty that are low corruption risk or high corruption risk. And we can talk, you know, in the Q&A session about how we measure this corruption risk. But what is really interesting is that we started seeing across the, 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 the 28 country, like 272 networks that I constructed, I started seeing patterns, uh, typical patterns of configurations of network structures. And it, you, know, you look at what you see here is a public institution connected to business suppliers that won public procurement contracts. The link is the contract. So this is this is financial flows basically, public money. How public money was spent with a, a certain uh, corruption risk indicator on the contract. So what you see here, for example, are cases like the Netherlands in 2016, where you have basically like one big orange component or high corruption risk component, and then you have you know a lot of disconnected components and you have a few islands of clean contracting. Then you see situations like the United Kingdom where you have these orange hub and spoke configurations where you usually have like a public institution connected to different business suppliers um, based on high corruption risk contracts. 
But then you also see how they are connected to one another. These islands are connected to one another in a, in a, in a much uh, more dense way. Then you have situations like Hungary in 2012, where it's really striking to see in the public procurement sector how the clean contracting and the high corruption risk contracting institutions and businesses do not actually touch each other. They don't interact with each other at all. So they, they are very much aware of the market structure. They're very much aware of who's who. It's clear that there are like two camps. I mean, this seeing this, visualizing this for the first time, uh, for Hungary at least, it's it not only confirmed qualitative information or, or you know, hunches that we've had about the situation in Hungary being very polarized, but it really shows uh, very strikingly how this, is, how this is happening. And then my favorite example is Romania in 2014. Why is that? Because Romania is most, most often um, characterized as being the most successful country in the world uh, in terms of anti-corruption. The anti-corruption agency put a, a, you know thousands of high-level politicians and business people behind bars in the last 10 years. Um, but still, you know, if you look at the corruption research, you see that corruption in Romania didn't significantly decrease. And the question is why? Uh, well, you know, the answer I think is pretty clear in this in this particular visualization, where you see that at least in the public procurement sector. The high corruption risk contracts and the low corruption risk contracts form, form what we call a hairball. This kind of hairball structure is a very robust structure. So whatever kind of interventions in terms of dismantling corruption in Romania you do without first identifying these clusters, these, these hairballs, and without analyzing them carefully in order to disentangle who's who and what's what, um, it's it's almost impossible to dis, to dismantle these you know institutionalized corruption machines if you do it at random. And why am I saying that they're doing it at random? Because the you know the overwhelming majority of corruption investigations start from whistleblower accounts um, or from tips and other and other external sort of input. Uh, for, you know, that go to the anti-corruption agency. So what they are forced to do by law is, of course, to start and investigate. But when you're trying to map out a network, you know, from a bottom, with a bottom-up approach without having uh, an intuition about its dynamics, uh, what happens then, it's exactly what happened in Romania, meaning that uh, you invest a lot, you stretch the resources and the capabilities of the institution, but you have minimal, at the end, minimal impact on, on these robust networks that are, you know, dynamically re reinvent, not reinventing, but uh, like uh, changing. So yes, you take one person, but then another person or, or another institution takes its place. Um, so just by looking at these network structures allowed us to make an argument that we need to do a lot more of this in order to um, have more strategic approaches to interventions and prevention campaigns uh, for anti-corruption. Um, so one idea was that, you know, you can develop this data-driven interve intervention framework based on network and data science where you basically if you are a case like the Netherlands, you are an easy target, easy to target uh, market because you basically see that this is the problem. You go and investigate and audit, and you know do further research. And then if you if you dismantle whatever is high corruption risk here, then the entire structure collapses, and you basically uh, it, it makes it harder for it to reattach. If um, you have situations like this, you basically look for linking actors where you have the, uh, a fragmented network structure and, uh, and overlapping corruption risks. You look for the linking actors, you start dismantling, you know, you start separating the components, and then you go to this more central ones and you start dismantling from there. So basically break down the structure uh, in a strategic targeted way. 
if if there are situations like in Hungary, then it's even easier than in the UK because then you 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 can do interventions without the fear of um, hurting the healthy part of the system. You can actually now you know who the healthy part of the system is, and you can encourage examples of good practice. You can you know you can definitely uh, capitalize on on how connected this part is in order to uh, uh, understand how competition works, how healthy competition works, and uh, and be able to promote that and support that. Now, most anti-corruption, most anti-corruption studies in general, but also approaches um, do not emphasize that much the healthy part of the system. But I think with this approach, you know, looking at the network structures and having these indicators on corruption risk is very, is a very, uh, you know, it has its added values. And then in Romania as well, so if you have, you know, high discretionary power where you have a very cohesive um, network structure with a lot of overlapping corruption risks, then here, obviously, you need to do much more uh, complex analysis in order to understand who's who. And you also need to do um, intervention scenarios, like disruption scenarios. You need to simulate a lot of the disruption scenarios because here there's a lot of discretionary power where whether you contract with high corruption risk or with low corruption risk. And if you are not very careful, like it happened, for example, in many cases in Romania where, you know, the head of an institution would be put behind bars and then the entire bureaucracy would just freeze because people wouldn't, they didn't know the difference between right and wrong anymore. Um, incompetence and, and malintention, basically. So it, it just happened that the entire bureaucracy or administration became much more inefficient when, when uh, um, these kinds of analyses were not done. So now we're working with the competition authority in Romania. We're expanding this into a, a large um, uh, methodology based on network, network analysis. All right, now let's go to a different kind of example, the one in business. So I'm also head of OrgMapper Academy. I've been with Maven7 for a while now. Uh, Maven7 is a, is a company that does um, network research uh, in, in general uh, for organizational development and change management. Um, so what we are doing with, uh, uh, what we are doing there is basically organizational network analysis. And what this methodology allows us to do is uh, are two things. One, identify influencers within companies or organizations. They don't necessarily have to be companies. They can be civil society organizations or any kind of organization that we, you know, that we know has some communication problems or has problems with retaining talent or has problems with um, uh, motivating or engaging people, or it's going through, you know, hard changes like culture changes, mergers and acquisitions, um, um, technology implementations of coronavirus, laying off people or scaling up too fast or, or not being able to scale at all. Um, so there are many situations, many business situations or organizational development situations where, where, um, Top managers are really interested in understanding who are the people they can they can uh, best in, involve into into the design of the next step for the organization, basically. And we are able with network analysis to identify that. Uh, and the second thing that we do is we do these communication diagnostics. So we are able to map out formal communication networks as well as informal communication networks, or what we call networks of trust. So we have, you know, a survey that we hand out to, uh, you know, all the employees of the company. And then we use this methodology of organization network analysis in order to find different kinds of influencers. A social hub, you know, persons that are high in con social connectivity, but sort of uh, it's a peer nominated process. So we ask people to nominate who the most trusted people are they communicate with. Who are the, the people that they go for or that they go to for advice in, you know, with work related questions? Who are the people they, they find, you know, ready for change or who are the people who motivate them and who inspire them on a day, day to day basis? So what this is able to do is then provide us this very um, comprehensive 
peer nominated network of trust. And with the methodology, we are able to, to find, you know, who are the people who are really good in, in, in socializing, in social hubs, or who are the people who are, you know, mostly referred to uh, for, for uh, their professional capabilities, but they're not necessarily super connected. And then, you know, who are the people who are both uh, very um, highly socially connected and well regarded in terms of their professional capabilities. And, and then, you know, top management can actually train them to become the next leaders of the organization. Um, they, they can uh, make them ambassadors of, of different things. So these are people who are already doing, they're very aligned with the organization's um, values and, and vision, even if that vision changes. So they are able to adapt very quickly and they're also able to inspire their peers. So once, if you give them recognition for these roles, then they are also more likely to assume these roles and, and act on them. They continue to act on them, but they're also kind of publicly acknowledged by their peers for, for doing so. And it, you know, it turns out that um, most influencer programs, development programs are extremely successful and they are successful, especially in times of change when, when things get tough. Um, so it, again, you know, it's a it's a different way of doing it than asking the top managers who do you think are the most important or influential employees um, beneath you. Because you know, when you have when you have a huge company, then it's absolutely impossible to know who actually is doing uh, well. So then, this is a, a different way of doing it. Um, and networks of trust. This is super important. So uh, in in many cases. What, um, what people usually just resume their analysis to is the quality of formal communication, which is great. We need to know, you know, uh, the quality of formal communication, but networks of trust, this informal, these informal networks, sometimes they, you know, people run away from them because they think, yeah, these are, these are um, you know, gossip networks or, um, you know, Informal networks undermine our authority and things like that, but this is definitely not it, or at least not the way we map networks of trust. So what we're interested in is, um, you know, who are the people who, who feel safe uh, in their workplace interacting with others? Um, so, for example, we can do, you know, we can show different layers of the organization, different business units and different layers with different uh, colors in terms of representing how uh, bad communication is uh, in within their departments. This is actually a video, but I, I see here that I don't have a button to click on it. But basically, if you, this is from our web interface. So we have a software basically that we developed that, that does this uh, automatically. And the user is able to interact with different slices of the organization that represents you know, the employee level, the middle management, the uh, top management and the, and the uh, sorry, the, the employee level, the team leaders, the middle management and the top management. And then you know, the redder the color, um, the poorer the uh, quality of, of uh, formal communication. But then if you zoom into, into this, for example, you also see the you will also see the flows of communication and then you start seeing the bottlenecks. So which hierarchy levels suffer from, from different communication issues? And then you can have this organizational overview where you see your business units or your departments on two axes. One is so on the on the on the vertical axis you see. Um, the quality of formal communication and on the horizontal axis you see the amount of informal communication and then you can have business units that are high in they have you know good quality communication and good um, high informal activity and they're doing fine but then you have um, departments or business units where you have good formal communication but almost no social cohesion and then you have uh, departments where you have a lot of social cohesion, but no access to very, very good uh, quality formal communication. And then this, again, you know, this is very actionable inside because you, you know exactly who are the influencers based on the analysis in these departments. And then you can design all sorts of interventions. Some of them are very simple 
and you are able then to move your business uh, units into this quadrant. And then of course you have uh, business unit units that have low quality communication and low informal activity, which means that for these kinds of uh, business units, you need to have you need to you know you need to design uh, much more complex interventions and to allow you know a different timeline for them to to develop. So one interesting example here is that uh, when we designed this software, um, we had you know very thorough um, UX research and UI research, and it turns out that showing networks to business people is not a very good idea, or at least not in this context, because people start asking questions. So why am I not that person? <laughs> why am I not? You know, even though I'm the CEO, why am I here or I'm here? And things like that and that derails so it turns out that it derails them from you know the big picture uh, and the the focus area that we would like them to um, to look at which are you know the positive side of the of the things which is okay so we we gave up we just present this kind of information uh, in the proposal but then what we show in the platform is something like this so we anonymize all the information. Uh, we get, you know, the consent of, of people who are detected as influencers that, they, you know, perhaps they would like to, uh, you know, make their, their name public, for example. But then we created data visualizations that minimize the, um, um, the risk of people misinterpreting roles and positions within the company. So we, we, we left this kind of hierarchical levels easy to and familiar for the people to understand. Uh, but we added this layer of, you know, with different shades of colors, the quality of the information. So all the information about the networks is there, but it's just shown in a very different way. So that we, we sort of uh, take the shift away from asking unnecessary, irrelevant questions at the moment and focus on what you can actually do to improve um, the standing of your organization. So this was the business case. Now let's go a little bit into the civil society case. Now this is a very recent uh, analysis that we've done on trying to understand for a particular city, one of the largest cities in Romania, how organizations mobilized in donations during the lockdown. So, you know, I'm sure that this happened in Portugal as well uh, as in Romania. So during the lockdown, organizations really, I mean, you could see uh, uh, such a refreshing view of people helping each other, you know, helping um, the, the vulnerable members of the society with providing goods, with helping children get, you know, technology and access to online education and, and you know, many, many things like that. So we, we did a prototype study on Cluj, Cluj-Napoca, which is the, you know, second, third largest city in Romania, um, it was super active and the context was right for us to, to be able to map that. So we, we basically handed out a survey to as many organizations as possible from all sectors, you know, business, public institutions, NGOs, even private persons, um, to a report who they donated uh, to, in what amounts, uh, these, what you see here, are, are um, you know, euros. Um, some of them are approximated, um, and some of them are, are exactly what was donated. And, um, and with whom they partnered in these situations. So we, we were able to have like three different types, more than three, but I'm showing you here three types of visualizations of and our purpose really was to understand the resilience of the local level ecosystems of mobilization. So we want to understand, you know, if another crisis hits, how does the local ecosystem of organizations interact and how can we maintain and support interactions that are adaptable to different kinds of crisis management? Uh, and hopefully if we can find in you know, in thing ecos like uh, uh, structures or or mechanisms uh, that are cross sectoral. 
So what you see here, for example, is the map of donations, the network of donations. You see here, for example, this is the Association for Community Relations. Uh, and with different colors, you see the kinds of donations that were done. So for example, with uh, red, you see money. So these are sums of money. This is Transylvania Bank donating to like foundations and, and hospitals uh, and associations. Um, if it's blue, then it's in kind. So donations in kind, they basically bought like masks and equipment and all of that. And generally, you know, you see that the hospital, the clinical hospital for infectious diseases in Cluj received, you know, uh, in kind um, um, donations and also money donations and so on. Uh, and then you see with, with green, relationships uh, representing pro bono services. So if, if one organization, one association, for example, donated pro bono hours for this other organization. This is a, a rather sparse network because not, not all the organizations were able to quantify uh, very well um, the money flows. But I think, you know, for us, it was sufficient to sort of understand a few patterns of, you know, who are the receivers, who are the givers, what kind of institutions receive, what kind of institutions give, and so on. What are the clusters of, you know, different colors? What brings them together? A second uh, view or perspective that we could take at this ecosystem was to look at the action areas. So two action areas are connected if one organization donates in both areas. And here you have, for example, you see the largest ones are um, support for um, elderly and vulnerable people. Then you have um, buying and donation of equipment, medical equipment and protection equipment. Then you have uh, money donation, uh, um, like, uh, um, um, I forgot the, the name in English, um, when you make a call to receive donations um, for um, organizations that combat um, the spread of the, of the uh, virus. Um, then you have like inf correct information and um, uh, and control of disinformation organizations and, and so on. And then you see, you know, the core action areas. So this is where organizations of different kinds donated the most in these areas. But then you also see the, the ones in the periphery, like for example, um, uh, Judi like not judiciary, but uh, legal legal support, legal services uh, for employees, for the protection of the rights of employees, right? So there was little support in this area. I mean, one would expect, for example, that you would see a lot more pro bono services in this area, but uh, it seemed to be quite, quite little. Um, this is uh, uh, culture and well-being. So an area that, or an action area that was not that much uh, in the attention of organizations and so on, right? So what we are able then to see are, okay, within this particular crisis, you have the typical um, most stringent um, action areas. But then you, you know, if you dig deeper into this, you also see media effects and you see where sort of the expectations are that you donate or, or how that relates to the capacities communication and visibility capacities of certain organizations and which are the other areas that are sometimes, you know, re like uh, in the periphery of the uh, public um, eye. Uh, also, you can see where the redundancies are and you are able then to, you know, talk to the organizations and tell them, okay, you know, there seems to be, you know, we've got this covered, maybe we can turn our, our direction now towards this particular area which needs your attention. And then we could also see the partnership network. And with different colors, you see different communities of uh, partnership. What is really interesting to see um, is, for example, the, the role of the university or uh, the role of the public institutions. 
uh, or the role of certain certain NGOs and so on. So you know, if you know, if you get to know the local ecosystem a little bit, you you start seeing patterns uh, or you start getting information that was otherwise um, unknown, and you start understanding how easy it it becomes to um, institutionalize some sort of um, some, some patterns of mobilization and partnership and collaboration in order to be prepared for any kind of other crisis that come over. It was really interesting to see that, for example, um, one of the, the organizations, uh, Association Beard Brothers, was very, was very uh, well connected to all the clusters all the other kinds of institutions that were participating. And it was also one of the one of the organizations that received most of the donations. So what you don't see in this picture, for example, you just see the, the ones with, that have a financial tag. But uh, in the background, we have all sorts of other um, uh, donation uh, relationships that, you know, for which people didn't estimate. So what it, it turns out that the Association Beard Brothers received a lot of donations and it was very, very important for us to understand the role of this organization in the local ecosystem, both in terms of being able to mobilize, you know, as an in-betweener, a very diverse network of collaborators in terms of, cri in, in terms of crisis, but also to be able to mobilize donations for their cause or for the causes for which they, they participated. All right, so this was my, my last example. Um, I, I certainly, you know, worked on many other interesting um, projects. So if you're interested in like, you know, how to mobilize diaspora to participate um, in the country uh, on certain things, we can talk about that. Uh, there's like many other projects that I, that I worked on that are super fascinating, uh, where I use data visualization mostly in, in terms of networks, because this is what I, I find, you know, at this point still missing from our perspectives and also very, very valuable way of showing information. It's not always easy because, you know, networks can still be mis misinterpreted. So there's a lot of responsibility on the, on the hands of the researcher or designer to, to portray these networks in a very fair and, you know, um, and accurate way. And just to finish, um, I would like to take I would like you to take this away with you uh, for tonight. Um, the current digital transformation is a good place to start anew. I think you know now we are in a context where we where we can propose and we can insist that things are being done in a different way. So reimagining data visualization as the new normal in almost every organization has its place at the moment as we speak because all the companies, all the, all the institutions are reinventing themselves at the moment. And they're, they're asking hard questions about how to move forward. How do you maintain social cohesion when your workforce is remote? How do you maintain social cohesion when your kids are not interacting and they don't know each other? They only see each other in small boxes uh, during four hours a day that are anyway interrupted with so many other things. So I think as researchers and as designers and, and as you know, business people, we need to communicate this message better that, that we need data visualization to um, help us to make you know, decision-making better. Of course, data visualization is powered by data. So it's this data-driven evidence-based decision-making that we can really not go about without anymore. Um, and you know, often it's, it, it almost, like at least in, in my experience, I almost never had to go into very complex data visualization. You know, the simpler and the more effective, the better. Because you anyway still have to, 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 to win like basic battles. How do you get access to good quality data? How do you get, how do you, how do you get the needs of the users? And how do you are how are, how are you able to start a project or a or a platform that will last the next ten years 
uh, when you have data sources that change their structure very uh, often or where you have people that change very often uh, or when you have you know massive changes coming about where with a lot of uncertainty how do you manage to create something or to design something that is able to adapt quickly and effortlessly to all these complex changes and finally what i think you know the the, the key basically to everything that i've managed to do so far and i encourage you to do is to have more of these kinds of events where people can learn from each other. They can link to one another and they can learn from each other. And especially during a time like this one, when we're going through so much changes. So, you know, Sara mentioned that I'm part of this, I'm co-founder of this uh, uh, CACTI, um, Civic Anti-Corruption Tech Initiative. What basically what this initiative is, or is trying to do during the COVID time, is to create these narrow corridors this kind of beer conversations uh, where you are able to talk about your work and your struggles and the opportunities and to know each other in a very relaxed way um, because we, you know, we don't have the capacity to, to meet each other anymore face to face. So, so we kind of need these, you know, narrow corridors where we can talk informally, uh, you know, free, uh, you know, acknowledge the stress we're going through and acknowledge the, the, the hardships that we're going through and the, the fact that we need to reinvent everything that we do on the spot. Um, and then allow each other to build you know, the community this way, by linking and learning from one another. I think that's the only way we can build sustainable products in any sector. And you know, sustainable products like the ones I'm working, I'm working on, for example, that, that have you know, the stakeholders are or the beneficiaries of these are, are you know, large amounts of people. <laughs> so for, for their sake, um, for me, it's uh, also very important, I do practice that, um, is that I, I get to know people and I get to talk about their work and I talk about my work and we learn from each other. So on that note, I would like to tell you that I feel much closer to <laughs> Lisbon or to Portugal day by day because each week it seems I have a meeting with uh, a Portuguese team uh, from very different areas, you know, anti-corruption and business and academia and all of that. I was uh, also a visiting scholar at Nova uh, Man Information Management School uh, last year for a month. Uh, I was working with uh, Flavio Pinheiro, I worked with uh, Jose. Um, um, uh, yeah, so I, I work with many people from, from Portugal. Um, so I'm really happy to, to be able to link and learn from you guys. Thank you very much. I'm not sure how much I talked. Uh, probably a lot more than I was supposed to talk. All fine, all fine. It Thank you, Ray. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, you know, as I said, this is not uh, a work that I do alone. I, I always work in teams, and these are my teams. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Great, great. So now we have some time for some questions. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. That was a really nice insight in your work and a nice overview and kind of the different chapters. And uh, what, what made me curious, of course, because I am a designer myself, is more like uh, you mentioned that you have created many prototypes and projects together with programmers. And I wanted to know what's your experience actually with uh, creating data with incorporation with designers. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any suggestion, any, uh, yeah, like this? Um, so it depends. So I've worked with, the, with designers who come from the art side. And I've, I worked with designers who come from the computer science side. And, and the experience with working with, you know, the two sides was a little bit different. I think, you know, computer scientists are much more, um, you know, strict in terms of functionality. But, you know, the artist was really able to, you know, include a lot of the, I don't know, nuanced experience of understanding data in, in, a, in a quite different way, actually. Um, so I think it's a fine balance. It's also a matter of, you know, pragm pragmatism. Uh, at the end of the day, you kind of, you, you know, you iterate the prototype and then you improve on that based on research and on testing and on experimentation. Mm. Um, 
but uh, but I always love working with designers because you know I trust I trust them I trust their methodology uh, I trust their um, opinions um, and and also I don't shy away from arguing or or you know yeah arguing over how things should be done um, and and I think this kind of conversation back and forth over over how we should do things is very productive and constructive because the end goal is to make things better. <laughs> Yeah, sounds great. There is even a question from the audience that uh, I would say for. Sorry, I just want to say okay. some words to Sylvia, just because uh, um, she mentioned people that she works with uh, in Portugal. And uh, I must thank Jose publicly that yes. we introduced this uh, and it made, made this connection possible. Uh, I think Absolutely. it's very important, uh, yeah, because uh, I lived in Budapest, we never met there, um, it's a shame, um, but it, yeah, now we have the, this opportunity, sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to, not to go No, it's back. very important because, yeah, 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 because Jose is the I kind hope of person watching who, this. <laughs> yeah, who, who links, you know, communities together, and I think that's a, it's a very It'd valuable... Be lovely. Uh, to make yes. a network yes. visualization about oh, this yes. and these connections yes. and how we connect people. <laughs> I'm sorry, just That's a side right. note. Let's go to the question, actually. Yeah. Yeah, let's go yeah. to the but question. It, uh, even more this, this year, because I mean, I think the network growed really all over. Mm, that would be yeah. really interesting to see actually impact like this. Maybe a new project? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> if you guys help me, no? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Oh, yeah, anyway, we have, we're making, ask all the events, research for all the events. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> we have the Data Science Society. Maybe they help us out. Okay, yes. uh, it's cool. Oh, I will the add the um, one question from the audience. Uh, there is Anat Sohar, he's asking, could you mention some of the tools that were used in the different projects? Were those mm -hmm. chosen based on the developer situations or data? Uh, well, it depends because we use a multitude of, of tools for the uh, proprietary tools um, we use, um, well, I would say for the open source, open source tools, we use open source, uh, for the open source projects, we use open source tools. So every, uh, yeah, like Python, R, um, network visualization, um, JS is, you know, JSON uh, readable software, um stuff like that so, so, so actually for the proprietary the... tools yeah mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure yes, Sarah, you wanted to add something uh, just it depends on the project i believe and since you are coming mainly from academia i believe that open source tools will be the preferred ones uh, makes sense not only that but also in the civil society i mean for civil yeah. society it's very important for us to to you know link link on github and have everything open mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and transparent um yes because there's a so i'm also part of a code for romania community which is also the um the largest and the most active um volunteering organization that brings together you know it people and designers and communication specialists and researchers in and what we do is basically we develop uh public tools public sector tools so we, we improve the efficiency of uh, public institutions by developing open source platforms and things like that related to you know public data um so yeah everything that we use is is open source in these projects and in academia as well okay yeah. perfect so i have also a question maybe we can i i don't have it written i'm sorry to all but um so going back to the barbecue uh, moment um so just happened um at that moment or uh, that you decided to make a visualization within your PhD um, uh, thesis or it was something planned ahead? 
Um, it was something planned ahead. So, so during the last phase of my PhD, when I was writing it up and and things like that, I was already involved a little bit in you know like in different. Um, well, I was involved for a while now in in different uh, uh, volunteering uh, projects or projects within the civil society pro bono services, and um, and it felt quite. Um, natural that this would be the next step further building such a prototype would be the next step further and um i just needed to find the right people to do it and the right people just happened to be at the beer <laughs> at this barbecue okay. it community barbecue um so it was very okay, serendipitous so yeah it's it's good to know that because i, I believe that a lot of phd uh, theses um or outcomes uh, are lost uh, in the, the thesis itself. So the, the tools are not created afterwards or the, the outcome is not public, avail uh, public available to for the ones that take the decisions to decide upon that. Yeah. So it's good, good that, uh, that you thought ahead. Perfect. Agreed. And then, you know, I, I always had this, this idea that whatever I learned in school, you know, must, somehow be applied in the real world because you know being a social scientist i i couldn't i couldn't find my oral political scientist i couldn't find myself being lost just in the library uh, and i and i really believe in this way of doing education you know for for a, with with purpose uh, that serves you know much more than just libraries it, it serves uh, people so yeah it was a pretty natural step forward nice yeah, you, you're also pre-mentioned when we talked in private before that uh, you are a bit lonely with your job description and that uh, even, as you said, uh, UX designer, for example, was not really a definition yet. And, and your first step on the academia side, you said that a lot of students leaving and that you tried to help a bit on this definition researching but end up in IT. But you think it's also reason that they got underpaid and work in different areas that even just that the definition is somehow missing or the awareness of what they're really doing? Uh, I'm not sure. I think the problem is quite complex. It also has a little bit to do with, you know, the how quickly academia, at least at the bachelor's level, uh, manages to, or in certain countries, manages to adapt to a very, very dynamic work uh labor market like you know even even the you know computational social scientist or data scientist or i mean these job this jobs didn't exist or they weren't as hype as they are now 10 years ago uh but the curricula you know the the, the entire public sector academic uh infrastructure moves you know quite slow in that sense so i think on the one hand um the academic system didn't manage to adapt very easily to or very quickly to these kinds of jobs, mostly if you're anything else than computer science. Mm -hmm. So if you are a computer scientist, maybe it's easier to go there. Uh, it's, you know, the, the job market that is very uh, def well defined for you guys, you know, it's, it's there. But for social scientists, it's definitely mm -hmm. not there. Um, but there are many, right? There are many communication specialists um, mm -hmm. that, you know, graduate with a diploma that can do, uh, can go into UX design and UI design. Um, but, you know, in Romania, there's no formal job description for UX or UI mm -hmm. design yet. I mean, there's I a lot of informality and a lot of, yeah. you know, bottom-up community development. Yeah. I also noticed like a lot in the design area when I started studying to now, like so many weird job description came up. I think actually a lot of them just give themselves a name for defining and it's even yes. an ongoing decision in the database area. Like what name, yes. how do you name yourself? There is no clear definition yet. And I think that's developing. So it's coming what you say from bottom up. Yeah. So. Exactly, exactly. And then you end up going because you like this kind of jobs, right? You kind of you want to go into an IT company, but nobody gives you a lot of money because you have a different diploma and you mm -hmm. don't have experience. <laughs> or I even if you have this yeah. experience, you don't have like the qualifications for it, for the job. Yeah, I think that's in every um, country. They ask you to have three years of experience when you finish studies and that please really fast. So be really young. Uh, I yes. mean, that's an ongoing problem. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. 
I think there are also different ways in which we can uh, we can you know start doing steps into into helping both students and the labor market adjust mm -hmm. to the new students. <laughs> yeah. That's the cool. ideal. Um, so I have an, another question, but I, I, will, I would like to try to have the slides here. I don't know if you can. we can do that. It's just I wanted to go to this uh, lovely project that you have on institutionalized uh, corruption uh, with the networks mm -hmm. from different countries. Uh, I don't know if we can manage that. But, can, you, um, can you still see my, my slides? Yeah, yeah, perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. All right. That's there. Yeah. Uh, so which one? Uh, this one or the other one? This one. Or this perfect. one. So, uh -huh. uh, no, no, the networks, networks? The networks one, okay. To go, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Then Maybe we'll... the delay. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious because, uh, as I mentioned, I lived in Budapest and I actually came back because of the political scene uh, was mm. not going uh, towards a nice result. So um, it, this network is from 2012. And I'm just wondering, uh, is this like a photograph or uh, these networks, how, how, so how much do, do they change uh, mm. over time? Mm -hmm. Well, actually they're, they're quite robust. I mean, they, they do change a lot. So for example, you see in, in Hungary over time, they, they remain quite separate uh, from, I looked from over a period of 10 years. So until 2018, so from 2008 to 2018. Oh, with Fides and they remain, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they remain quite stable in terms of, you know, being polarized. In, in Romania, for example, you see at one point, um, or in Poland, you can actually see it very clearly. There's a component that a very, um, you know, clean contracting component that kind of separates from the high corruption risk. So in Poland, as you can imagine, it's it's you know, it's the largest public procurement market in Europe, and um, and it's basically all like a big ball of fur. <laughs> So what it, what we see in Poland over years is you know a distancing like a, a, a the healthy a, a, a small section of the healthy part of the system kind of breaking off from the hairball and starting doing you know uh, business on their own uh, and separating themselves basically from from the murky side. Um, and in Romania as well, you can see, you know, this kind of game between, you know, being going into being separated, but then coming back together again. Um, and I think there's there's definitely much more to explore there, right? So the political angle and uh, and uh, the change of, you know, the public procurement law and and many other. Do you remember granular? Do you remember by any chance uh, the, the 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 network from Portugal uh, regarding this? Yes, I remember. But actually, from the entire data set, the uh, Portuguese data set was the was the worst quality. Oh. Good to know. In the sense, we have... <laughs> in the sense, in the sense that I think there was missing a lot of information because oh. it it basically came out as completely clean, which is of course something that mm. <laughs> it's hard to believe. <laughs> It's okay. tricky, uh, but but it's also because of the data quality. So of course, you know the the reporting quality, the standardization, the the data sanitization uh, procedures are extremely important. There there were a few cases that were really weird, like you know, for example, Denmark. In Denmark, uh, we started seeing uh, high levels of, of state capture, which goes against the um, you know, our knowledge of what happens in that market. So again, there, you know, there might be some issues with with data. But for the rest of the countries, it was quite quite okay. Hmm. Yeah, but with Hungary, with Portugal, I couldn't I couldn't actually do anything. Okay, it's a pity. Uh, so I need um, I need I new data. <laughs> But when was it uh, that you did the, this analysis? It was quite recently, you know? Like I started did... it last year, yes. I started it huh. last year. So we still don't have uh, data, quality data for you to analyze now. 
It's not like it well, in, the, in the past. Whatever is like whatever it's on the open tender database. So if you Google opentender.eu, that's the database from which I got all the public procurement data. So that's the, uh, I'm not sure how often they uh, update, update. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, the data, but you can definitely, you know, check it out. I also like with Fabi Pinheiro from Nova, we're, we've been discussing from uh, for a while now to look into uh, local level public procurement in, in Portugal. So not only, you know, the, so what you see here are the contracts above 25,000 euros. But of course, you know, a lot of the high corruption risk happens at lower level, lower mm -hmm. uh, amounts, hmm. and and, uh, and they have and they have data for this. Yes, um, we have uh, we have it online. Base uh, B A S E has mm -hmm. the, the contract. So yeah, so yes. yeah, but maybe it's below twenty five k. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and this is something that you cannot find it for other countries. So most of the countries, for most of the countries, it's very hard to get lo local level data. But Portugal has a good database for that, a good mm. data set for that. Not all. So that. so, yes, we. I'm, I'm really <laughs> curious to 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 do that analysis. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Good. So I would say we wrap it up here. Thank you a lot right. for your time. Um, Thank you so much for the invitation. I hope it was. Uh, um informative and useful okay. <laughs> totally it was really nice. Nice. yeah yeah no, yeah it's and really thank nice you because it's listening. too late over there in romania it's two hours it's almost ahead. 10 p.m yes. oh, <laughs> for you you are starving no so let's well let's but, but besides that i'm like i'm really happy to talk about my work so thank you, thank you, so much. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity Great. So we, yeah, thank you a lot. And uh, we will now announce some more events and hope to talk to you soon, one day, another, and we stay in contact. Yeah. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you to the audience as well. I'm not sure how many people are there, but thank you so much for resisting. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. So, yeah. Thanks everyone for listening so much that uh, whenever you want to know something about us, just stay in contact. However you found us, you have already a bit of contact. Um, as we said, we have uh, three more interesting things to come to announce and our next event. So stay tuned just for a few more minutes. Uh, one thing coming up quite soon is the Data with Life. Uh, it's at the November 10th and there's an extra session at the 12th. And this is like better data visualization for commercial success and social good. Uh, it costs, costs a little amount, but it's totally worth it. The speakers from Nadia Bremer, Andy Kirk, Stephanie Pozovec, and many, many more interesting guests um, attending that one. So that put you on your calendar, check it out. And one more, I will also try to totally attend it all, is the show conference. We in, uh, mentioned it last time already, and this will be super interesting as well. So it's of uh, making rules, breaking rules, and there really the speakers goes from Germany, America, uh, like Lisa Schalatros, Manuel Lieber, R.G. Andrews. So that one is also one, and we even have one more. Sarah will say a few words about it. Uh, this is this hackathon. Uh, yeah, I don't actually have much to say um, apart from the dates. Uh, go check to it's a Portuguese um, Portuguese event, but go and check. It will be an academic oh. that will happening by the end of the November, and uh, you should uh, practice uh, your skills and improve your skills. And if you want to do that and help um support the the, the other um your peers and so on so go to the yeah, to the context. for maybe making your academia exactly, exactly. Show for your search. And networking <laughs> networking is very important <laughs> yeah the the beer the beer moment it's important yeah. so yeah go and I check should. and um oh, maybe yeah, but first we wanted to go back to Fidzai because we didn't mention Fidzai properly and we couldn't do this without them. So thank you so much, Fidzai, and to keep supporting us. And um, yeah, 
uh, I hope we are giving uh, talks in the level that you deserve because you are a great uh, sponsor and let's keep working together. So let's announce the next event. Da, 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 da. Yay! <laughs> we are so happy, so happy to have Martin Lambrecht. I, I, I'm not pronouncing it right, but it doesn't matter. He will teach us how to pronounce it next time on the 3rd um, of December. So, yeah, he's well known in the field. Uh, he's, a data, uh, he's a data journalist, data designer, uh, visualization consultant. Uh, he has a really nice website with weird uh, but useful charts. So he will tell us all about next time. So please yeah. come, and, keep uh, coming to our events, even if virtual. I know that we are all tired of being online all the time, but it's uh, let's take this opportunity to learn with the, the ones that we can't bring uh, in normal situations to Lisbon uh, that easily, or at least for now. Uh, yeah, so keep uh, posted. We will release uh, yes. further news later on. And that one will be even more kind of what you're asking us, hands-on ah, yeah. tool. So that will be really interesting as well. Yeah. Not a workshop, yeah. but going yeah. to more technical uh, stuff. So worth to, to attend. Yes, he will share his thing right away, which tools he's using and how he's using them. So thank you very much for your patience, for watching us again, attending the event and see you hopefully all next time. Tell your friends. <laughs> have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.